Welcome. My name is David F. Wilson and you're listening to Dust, David's Ultimate Stone Talk, a podcast that aims to explore all aspects of the stone trade, from its ancient origins to its contemporary use as a medium of cultural and creative expression. It's my great pleasure today to welcome onto Dust my favourite American mom, Jan Johnson. Jan is not a stone worker. She's a landscape designer, you know, one of those annoying people that come in after us stone workers have completed our part of a project. We've sweated over every joint, carefully aligned every stone, made every effort trying to get everything just so. Then they come along at the end and hide all that hard work and toil with plants. Obviously, my tongue is firmly in my cheek there. One of my own best known pieces of work are the stone walls at what is known as the Edinburgh Airport Interchange in Central Scotland. This was my first really large stone wall in commission. I learned a lot while bringing it to fruition. One of the best lessons it taught me only became apparent to me with time. The importance to any stone project where soft landscaping is to be part of the same scheme, that it be given careful and equal consideration. It is only when walling and planting appear to be in balance does a design become truly successful. Upon completion, stonework has the tendency to appear stark and dominant in a setting, a bit too forthright for its own good. Once the planting establishes, it combines and cooperates with the stone, bringing the whole into harmony. Done well, it settles the stonework into a magical relationship with the surrounding landscape, a delight to the eyes and senses. We are ever increasingly living in a man-made, designed, managed environment. Our connection to nature is becoming more tenuous. Landscape design is a major discipline that aims to manage that continuum of separation by designing our shared and private spaces in the best, most thoughtful way possible. Across my career, I've had the pleasure to collaborate with some top landscape designers. They are an impressive and clever bunch. I simply only have to concentrate on the stonework. They have far more on their hands and everyone that I've worked with carries this off with aplomb. Their skills and knowledge are impressive and slightly intimidating. Firstly, they have to appreciate the possible. They then rip that apart, stretching those possibilities, reimagining the achievable, to create the new and interesting. They have the vision, the ability to see the component parts in the abstract. Within their mind's eye, They have to shift, pull, replace, fix and ultimately consider the many competing options and combinations to counterbalance the hard materials and the soft elements. Secondly, their familiarity with materials and techniques must be extensive. Only by having that knowledge within their purview can they have the confidence to drive forward and to inspire their team to bring their imagined design to life all at the same time as throwing out incomprehensible Latin in all directions. They really are quite annoying. But luckily for us, not too many of them consider themselves stone workers. They need us, thankfully. Tapping into other skilled trades is another of their attributes. They have a great ability to delegate. They put their trust in others to fulfil their ambitions. We in the Stone Tribe sometimes though might question if that trust is always justified. Such is some of the poor quality of stonework that is produced nowadays. It remains for a long time and it's painful to our eyes. As I've already mentioned, landscape designers are an impressive breed. Jan combines her day job with that of being a well-established author of four gardening books. Her latest, Floratopia, was just released in February 2021. Sharing her love and passion for all things plants and gardening is central to her being. Her Serenity in the Garden blog and Facebook pages are very popular and a great resource for tips and inspiration. A much sought after speaker, she has quite the schedule of appearances planned for the upcoming months. Jan first came to my attention when I was planning for my fellowship travels through seeing her post on her Facebook page, The Spirit of Stone. This is a dedicated page where Jan could highlight her love of stone and how she views it as the bones of the garden. The page is a continuation of the themes she explored in her 2017 book of the same title. Not merely a gardening how-to book, 
It provides the reader with a deeper understanding between the human space and the natural. It examines the why of stone. With some wonderfully evocative phrases, she explains how stone can be anything between a small voice or a booming song within any garden. How it is the chameleon material, fecund with potential, possibility and open to interpretation. As the title suggests, she explains how throughout the ages and across diverse cultures, humans, stone and rock have been united through myth, superstition, religious belief and ritual. Past societies have endowed it with meaning. It was never ignored. We as a species have indulged in cultural conversations with it, at a deep level of the human psyche, of shared feelings rather than language. Our connection to it is undeniable. It's a relationship difficult to articulate. Jan makes a good attempt in the spirit of stone to illuminate that relationship to a wider audience. Some of you who have seen my report might have been intrigued by its front cover. Meeting Jan made a significant contribution to its design. When I passed through Arizona, Peter Schaffsma arranged for me to give a talk at the Willow Bend Environmental Centre in Flagstaff. I gave a talk there followed by a practical workshop to build a freestanding arch. This is the main image on the cover. I combined that with an underlay of the flags of the UK and the USA as a symbol of making connections across the big pond. Atop that arch sits a red cardinal. After arriving in Newark Airport, slightly west of New York City, the first day of my fellowship travels was spent with an enjoyable visit to Storm King Arts Centre in upstate New York, a brilliantly inspiring space. This was one of the highlights of the whole trip. Walking around the two wavy goldsworthy walls that sit stunningly within that landscape was simply awe-inspiring. If I'd had to return home after just that experience, my trip would still have been worth it. Jan stays in Croton and Hudson, which in American terms is basically next door, a mere hour's drive away. We had arranged that our first night in the USA would end with a quick visit to meet her at home. As we stood there on Jan's doorstep, with finger poised to ring her doorbell, Jane and I looked at each other and quietly acknowledged that we were entering six weeks of the unknown, a prospect full of excitement and nerves. As soon as Jan opened her door, with the warm, friendly, joyful reception we received, it didn't look so daunting. Despite having worked all day, she was keen to put on a warm American welcome for us. Her partner Raphael had the barbecue on. Hamburgers were on the menu. Almost as soon as we stepped into their garden, a red cardinal landed on their lawn. Raphael mentioned his surprise, as they hadn't seen one for a couple of years. He explained they are symbolically seen as a good omen. One source we later found stated that you might be doubting your strengths. The bright red bird is a reminder to check your confidence and move forward no matter the obstacles in your path. That little visitor and Jan and Raphael's hospitality was the perfect start to our travels. It was a wonderful, prophetic beginning to our journey. Hi, Jan. How are you doing? Well, that was so, hello. That was such a wonderful little story. I didn't realize that about the car. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether you'd remember that or not. No, that's wonderful. So how are you doing? I'm doing great. And I do remember, and it's one of my funniest stories about when you and Jane uh, walked into my house. Can I share that story that I remember? Yes, yes, of course. Yes. Okay. So you, I was very excited to have visitors from Scotland. But I did not do my due diligence. I did not look you up on internet or anything. And the only thing I knew about you was that from our email conversations that you had won the Churchill Fellowship. Is that what you call that? That's great, yes. I knew you won the Churchill Fellowship and you were going to visit uh, stone features and stone workers uh, across the country. That's all I knew. And... Um, <laughs> It was, the, it was such a sweet thing. So you handed me this photo of this most beautiful stone uh, pyramid, would you call it? Yes, uh, yes. A dry laid stone pyramid. And I looked at it. It was so beautiful. It was in a beautiful garden. And 
of course, I didn't know who you were. And so I said to you, oh, did you take this photo <laughs> thinking perhaps you were the photographer? And Jane looked at me and she goes, he he built that. And I said, what? <laughs> and then I found out that you were quite a uh, well-known uh, stone artist in Scotland. And I had no earthly idea. It was like, <laughs> and then you casually said, yes, this one, the uh, silver at the Chelsea Garden Show. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? So my fame hadn't reached America by then. <laughs> no, it didn't. And, and, and Raphael, prior to you arriving, had said to me, well, how old are they and what do they do? And I said, well, he must be young because it's his fellowship and uh, I, he must be a writer and because he won the award and we had no earthly idea. So that was kind of... But as soon, was, as soon as you saw the wrinkles, you realized they were a lot older. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was like, oh boy. So that was, I love that story though. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a great evening. We really enjoyed it. They it, it really uh, started off the, the trip on a, on a great kind of note. So just uh, for the, the listener, just kind of give a, a visual picture of where your, your sort of general location is in the world. Oh, okay. So I live in the Hudson Valley of New York State and about uh, 40 miles north of New York City. And that's the Hudson River runs north south. And so the, uh, the area around the Hudson River is, is quite beautiful, quite lovely. And so uh, that's where I am, a little bit north in New York City. Um, yeah, we, we were very surprised. We kind of expected it to be a, a sort of massive urban sprawl, but you very quickly, once you leave the city, you're just out in the most beautiful kind of uh, countryside. It's, it's... Yeah, we don't, we don't have, we, we don't have all those track homes that go for miles and miles because of the topography. So that you get on the train in the middle of New York City and 40 minutes later, you're in the middle of a very kind of pastoral uh, sylvan uh, area. You yeah, know? beautiful part of the country. Very it really surprising is. Thank for you. us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and uh, a quick summa summation of, of of who you are and what your what your career is, what your job who, is. Don't you love that when somebody says, "So who are you?" So <laughs> you know, being a true American, we all define ourselves by our work, and I'm guilty of that as well. And and uh, so I am a uh, a landscape designer and uh, author. And I have been in the landscape design um, and horticulture profession for 45 years. Okay. I, I started out uh, in working in a landscape architecture office as an intern in Japan. And that was in the early 1970s and I just never stopped. And so, so have you always grown up in the kind of New York area? I, I grew up in the in New York City. I'm a kid from the boroughs. I'm a New York City apartment dweller. I was a New York City apartment dweller, but um, that wasn't where I was supposed to be, obviously, being into the landscape and into plants. And so four days after um, graduating high school, I took off. I, I've been in many places around the world and lived in Hawaii and New Orleans and Vermont. I've lived many places, but for the last... Uh, 35 years I've been here in the Hudson Valley. Okay, so you, you just kind of mentioned that uh, you, you, you left New York very quickly. What, what spurred that then? I, I, you know, New York City, it, it, it's a city and I'm not a city person. I, I love the city, but I like the earth. I like trees, I like rocks, I like plants and, uh, you know, Central Park in New York City was just not enough for me. And so where, where did that love or uh, interest spark from then? You know, it's interesting because I, I talk about this often is that when I was a kid, I was trying to grow plants on the windowsill of our little apartment in Queens and in Brooklyn. Um, when we moved to Brooklyn, I, I had a fire escape, which was a great, wonderful thing because then I started to grow tomato plants on the fire escape as a kid. And uh, I just always wanted to do that. And of course, where I lived, there were no street trees. There were nothing. It was a uh, you know, concrete jungle. So was there, a, was there an inspirational figure that kind of led you down that road or was it just something you, you kind of found you on your own? Oh, well, my, my parents were artists. I mean, they, that was their avocation and that they loved to go to museums and galleries in New York. So I really did have quite the wonderful art education growing up. But um, I ended up when I, I thought I want, I love the built environment. I went to an high school of music and art in new york city 
as an art student. It was a great school. You know, it's kind of like the fame school, if you ever saw that movie. And, uh, but I love the built environment. And I said to my guidance counselor, because that's what we have in high schools to kind of direct your path in life. And I, I, she knew I loved plants. She knew I liked to draw. And she said, uh, well, why don't you be a botanical illustrator? you know, for a job. And I thought, I don't want to be a botanical illustrator. I said, I was thinking of being an architect. And at that point, you know, she should have said be a landscape architect. You like, mm-hmm. but we, in New York City, back then, nobody knew of that as a profession. She didn't even know it of it as a profession. So I went off and uh, thought I'd be an architect. And that's how I ended in Japan working in an architecture office as a intern. And I, at that point, I had the opportunity to go to the Japanese gardens in Kyoto, the legendary Japanese gardens there. And you know, they're primarily rock and moss and evergreens. So that's what Japanese gardens are, you know, frankly, and sand. And I just freaked out. If there was a seminal moment in my life, it was when I went to visit those gardens because I the way I felt when I walked into these gardens was transcendent. Mm -hmm. And I went back back to my job, you know, to the office on, and I proceeded to put the building into the side of the hill and design the pathways and the bridges (laughs) and the trees. And my boss, my sensei in Japanese said to me, you're not an architect. He said, you're a landscape architect. And he sent me off to a landscape architecture office in Osaka. And uh, I thought I was the biggest failure in the world because he sent me away. But of course, you know, he did the best thing he ever could. I mean, that's what I was. And so what sort of projects were you working on there then? Oh, boy, in Japan, um, it was there was a... Um, well, the project that I was working on for the architect where I put the building in the side of the hill was considered crazy at the time, early 70s. And, and, all the, and it was all Japanese men in the office, women and women. And they all looked at what I was doing like, what are you nuts? I mean, really, they thought I was like a, from a different planet, which I was, frankly. And um, my sensei, I heard later, took my idea and made a uh, Japanese wedding park it's not so cool they have wedding parks i think that's so wonderful and he used my idea of setting into the slope and uh got a lot of acclaim for it which was fine by me because he set me on my my path at least i could you know give him an idea or two so that was and, and, pretty fun and was that how so how, how did uh, getting the internship from new york uh to japan <laughs> how did that work oh that you, just sounds like you a, know, the most amazing opportunity well the, you know you wanted me to go into that world. That would be, that's a long conversation. <laughs> um, very long. I, uh, we, we didn't have any money for college. My, it was just my father and I, but I had decided in my senior year of high school that, that I wanted to go to this college called Friends World College. It was uh, run by the Quakers. Do you know what the Quakers are? I guess that's a uniquely American. No, no, that started in England. Um, yeah, 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 no, that, that, I think they're worldwide. Yes. Yeah. So, so the Quakers started this college back in the late '60s that had no classes and no grades. It's it's perfect for today, you know. With, uh, but it was way ahead of its time. And I decided I wanted to go to this college because I wanted to see the world. And um, I. I got a full scholarship based on need. And the first place that I went was to their small center in the, in the, um, in, it wasn't in Western Kenya. And I lived, I worked in Africa. I worked in Kenya and Tanzania. And I, uh, I were, I, I had amazing experiences. This was, amazing. Before, this was even before, before Japan. Japan. And right. I was a little bit of a crazy, not crazy. I, was, I wasn't crazy. I was very um, adventurous and a little <laughs> stupid, though. Seriously stupid because uh, things I did were a little stupid. You know, uh, I was young. I was 18 years old. Was I going off uh, hitchhiking alone in Africa? <laughs> but um, I lived with the Maasai tribe. Life experiences, though. I live with the Maasai tribe, which is a whole another story. I worked in um, Ujamaa village in Tanzania, and I did city planning in Mombasa. 
And all of that um, informed my understanding of the world. And then from there, traveled to Japan. And uh, they were so intrigued about my experiences in Africa. That's how I got my job, because it's very difficult to, as an intern in this architecture office, because they just, they were very intrigued by Africa. Okay. <laughs> and the fact that I could speak Swahili and all that kind of stuff. So that, so it opened doors for me in Japan. And, and taking on a woman when you said it was a male dominated oh, environment. I, yeah, you, you know, uh, you talk about trailblazing. That was trailblazing. I was a gaijin, which means a foreigner, and a, a female in a totally male environment. But I think, you know, I was I was such a novelty to them that they they kind of enjoyed that. <laughs> I, I did know Japanese um, when I went there, and so the way I would learn is I would listen to the men talk in the office, be, and then I would kind of like put things together. What I didn't know is that in Japan, there was like the male way of speaking and the female way of speaking. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this. So I'm just talking the way the guys are talking. And every time I started opening my mouth, people would look at me in horror. <laughs> and I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I'm so dana. No, no, no. You don't say that. No. So this, yo. I mean, so it's a whole. Totally different. Totally wow. different. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, that was. But but honestly, uh, Japan had such an impact on me because of. Uh, of the gardens and their use of stone, their stone wall. I'm sure you know this. Yeah, yeah. The stone walls there are phenomenal. The 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 artisanship is spectacular. It's, it's on my bucket list. I'd love to go. I'm slightly oh. slightly jealous. There's um there's a girl who has actually she's been awarded a Winston Churchill Traveling Fellowship. She was meant to travel last year, and she's going to Japan to look at stonework. So well, you I'm, I'm really keen to see how how her trip goes and I'm really keen to kind of read her report so that'll be really I, interesting. I kind of think that me getting that scholarship is akin to you getting the Churchill Fellowship. Yeah sense, you, you, you know? got it much earlier. <laughs> yeah I got much earlier but it's the same idea you know go see yeah. the world go see the world and tell us about it you know. It's, it's, just, it's amazing you know to be able to be given that kind of opportunity so. Yeah. It looks like you've made you made the most of it. Oh yeah yeah. And um, so then you went on to the landscape architect office. So then, yes, I worked in the landscape architecture office in Japan uh, doing projects, which but then from there, I um, came home to New York City, whereupon I got very depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I got very depressed. I mean, there I was right back where I started in the little apartment, you know, and saying, what am I doing? You know, yeah. and at that point, I um, I I said my goodbyes yet again and went to Hawaii and studied landscape architecture at the University of Hawaii. That sounds like a, just, you know, to, to go to Japan and then Hawaii it just sounds amazing. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and it was a great place. This again was early 70s and it was a great place to study uh, because the outdoor living is, is their creed there. So it was a great place to study. And, and was there was there many female students then on that course? I was the only one. The only one. <laughs> I was the only one, and uh, and you know, again, I I I always tell people it's like you, back then they can't quite get it. I was representing my gender, in fact, you know. Mm -hmm. now, now, if you go, it's at least fifty percent female or majority female in the landscape design professions. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how quick that's changed. Yeah, yeah. Quite rightly, of, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, connection to the earth, perhaps. I'm not yeah. sure. So did you have to kind of fight your way or was it were you kind of accepted within mm. that kind of environment? Um, well, here we go. So at the same so I happened to be <laughs> when I lived in Hawaii, you know, I was young, I was in my twenties. I lived on an organic farm on the island of Oahu. That's the island where Waikiki, Honolulu is, you know. And um, so at the same time as studying landscape architecture, I was also just so immersed in organic farming. Mm -hmm. And so I was studying about the soils and, and the intercropping and all sorts of things, right? And we actually sold our, our crops to our organic crops to uh, restaurants and all. And so I had this 
unique perspective on the profession that incorporated uh, soils and the ecosystem and all of that. And uh, the landscape architecture profession at that time was not was not concerned with any of that. Mm, I was going to say that sounds like it's been quite kind of groundbreaking learning that you're going through. Yeah, that wasn't kind of mainstream. There was not. I, so that was the thing. I've always been a, a few decades ahead, which has been you know hard. Um, but <laughs> um, the other, th yeah. So I I uh, I was a little bit more too crunchy granola for the landscape architecture crowd. Uh, crunchy granola you know that, that means to explain that, that. That, yeah that means that what is that, is that a new york term <laughs> yeah that means that uh i was too, i was very earthbound i was into the spirit of the place i was you know talking to the trees kind of thing and that you know what are you what are you doing so when i when i studied landscape architecture um i i had to put on like a different hat and 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 just study about drainage coefficients and all of the very important engineering aspects of things notwithstanding not losing my personal understanding of the natural world does that make sense yes yes i, I take you then graduated and then where did you move from there so um, I, I then I had to go back to New York because family called, you know, it was like Hawaii's phenomenal, but my family uh, was back home. And so I came back home to New York, which is great because like I said, um, I, uh, I, I got myself a job outside of New York City up in the Hudson Valley at a place that you know well, because I took you there. And it's a resort hotel called Mohunk Mountain House. Amazing place. Correct. We'll, we'll right. put up some photographs. I uh, took some great photographs. And Stone is very kind of uh, central to that whole space. Oh, uh, yes. I remember when Raphael and I took you and your wife there, we kind of said, oh, we're just going to take you to this place before you go home to Scotland, not realizing that of course it was like the perfect place to take you yeah, it was yeah. with all the stone everywhere and, and then yeah so so yes go, going back i i got a job working in the uh gardens at that amazing mohunk mountain house and that was uh, a a perfect place to land frankly after all the things that i had been through because uh, now it was planting and growing flowers for the display gardens there and and i worked under a french gardener who had trained in versailles he was a master and so i learned professional horticultural techniques from him and that was a nice way to cap off my educational experience so, so that was a very kind of kind of ease and the, the the practical into your kind of uh, practice then exactly because i at that point i i knew a little bit of this a little bit of that but that was a great way to really learn it all and um and the stone there you know it is where mohunk mountain house is called there's a uh, rock cliffs there called the schwangunks mm -hmm. and it's the best rock climbing area in the northeast or in the east coast I'm glad you said that because I wasn't. Sure, I was going to ask you about that, but I wasn't sure how you could pronounce that. Well, yeah, it's Schwangunks, although the Native Americans said Shangum. That was the real name for them, and uh, but it is the most amazing rock climbing area because the cliffs are so beautifully uh, hard rock and they're exposed, and so I ended up uh, rock climbing, and. Uh, that that again got me back to the rocks. You sound <laughs> okay. quite quite the adventurous woman there because yeah, I'm yeah. I'm not going up. I like rock, but I'm not going up rock climbing. Yeah, it, it, it was it, yeah. It's not for the faint hearted. <laughs> that's for sure. I this was back like again. I say you know I was a little bit adventurous and a little bit wild. Not wild, but just I would try anything at that mm. point. Not anymore, but back then. <laughs> At least you've done it. Been the, the sort of training you've been undergoing in Hawaii, were you able to influence and, and put into practice some of, were you able to carry that through into your practice at Mohonk? Okay, so what was interesting about being in Hawaii was that it was an island, you know, the island of Oahu. And I 
being into the whole organics and learning about ecology back, way back when, I realized that uh, living on an island was it's a little bit focused you a little bit more on the systems of nature. And I went to the, uh, I made a presentation to the state legislature telling them that they should consider taking their, the, the waste, human waste and pineapple waste and composting it and making fertilizer. Similar, because a, a city called Milwaukee here in Wisconsin has done that forever. Their product is called Milorganite. It's the fertilizer that's used often on golf courses. And so I said to follow the model of Milwaukee um, and Honolulu should do the same. Well, again, I was a little bit ahead of my time. So <laughs> the uh, legislators said, thank you for your time. And, <laughs> you know, that was the end of that. But, but uh, yeah, so, so when I came to this, to, to back to New York, I was still into the idea of we should all be self-sufficient and we should all be, you know, market gardens. And I got very involved in rooftop gardening in New York City. Again, this was now late 70s. And um, we actually had a project going for rooftop greenhouses in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Uh, it won awards. But, um, you know, now rooftop gardening is big, which is great. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, I took all these ideas I had been accumulating and I kept trying to put them into practice wherever I was. Uh, Mo Honk, again, were you you part of a, an all male team or was there? Was well, there, that's a good question. Did, did you have kind of uh, mostly some men comrades? <laughs> mostly <laughs> men. I, I no, there there were there were um, yeah, there were two other women who came from a farm, so they were very uh, used to all the hard labor because it was hard. And uh, so I wasn't alone anymore. And of course, you know, working at a resort, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. It, it, they, they say that it was the model for um, uh, dirty, the movie Dirty Dancing, you know, where okay. everybody's... Patrick Swayze. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, working at a, a summer resort like that is a lot of fun. Um, and from there, from there, I went and I started teaching college at a very young age. Um, uh, How old were I, you now then? I was about 24. <laughs> At 24, I started teaching college. That's kind of crazy. But um, when they asked me for my resume, I gave them my resume and it was jam packed. So they, uh, you know, so I started teaching landscape development and maintenance at a local community college up in near New Paltz, New York. And uh, that was great. I, because I like to teach, I like to write, I like to teach. And taught all sorts of landscape development, maintenance practices. And, uh, and then, okay, this is where it gets a little nuts too. At one point, I um, was assigned to teach at a male prison, the same program. And most instructors got assigned one class a week to teach at the male prison, which is well, they assigned me all my classes to be taught at the male prison. So I was essentially teaching full time at the college courses at a male prison. And I was like 26 years old at that point. Oh. 20. And was that at the prisoner's request? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I went to the college president and I said, please, uh, I don't think this is educationally sound I mean and he's saying what do you mean by that what do you mean I'm, I'm 26 27 I look like I'm 22 and I said I don't think this is the right thing and they wouldn't listen to me and so very I was very upset but you know a job is a job so I went to this to Otisville Correctional Facility to teach my college courses well you know what happened David I loved it. I loved it. And you know why? These guys had nothing else going on except for the college classes. You know, students would go, they go out for a drink or whatever, do their homework. Not these guys. These guys had nothing else to do. So they were into it. So they really were really focused students then. They were the best students I ever had. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I loved it. And again, you know, I guess, you know, all men, I guess that's. I never thought about it before, but I guess that was kind of my, 
my modus operandi, you know? Mm. And so what, did they cultivate a garden within the prison? Then? We did. Oh, we did a lot. I mean, I was, like I said, I was very much into it. It was a great way to focus all my energies. And I had somebody, uh, a, a friend of mine, donate a solar greenhouse. And so we installed a solar greenhouse um, on the grounds of this. It's very, it was a very open country-ish uh, facility. It wasn't one big building. It was, it was spread out small buildings. It's still in, still in existence. So we put out, we, we installed the, uh, the, the class and I installed the uh, solar greenhouse and we started to grow fresh organic lettuce for the facility. And so then that got a lot of, uh, that was very newsworthy. So I got into a lot of newspapers and everything. <laughs> Hopefully you, know. you still have the clippings. I think I do somewhere. <laughs> you need to uh, take them out. Those will be I good know. Fun. But, and and um, again, I was, we, we had projects and I, they were all from the city uh, and they were all young. And primarily they were there because of the uh, onerous New York State uh, drug laws. So a lot of them were there for like drugs, but like marijuana you know, yeah. selling marijuana. And it, can you, I often think about it because now they're legalizing it everywhere here. I, is that the way? No, is not, not across here. No, oh. there, there is talk about it, but it hasn't, hasn't, oh, hasn't it, materialized. It, it's, it's, it's not everywhere in the United States, but it's coming. Yeah. And I often think about these guys who were like locked up and now, you know, possibly within the next five years or so, it's all going to be legal. I, yeah. I, how do they it's, feel? It's, it's, their, it's their youth that's that's gone isn't it for yeah, yeah but quite, um quite so, sad, so really. they were so they weren't like the hardcore terrifying you know hannibal lecter type people <laughs> they were, they <laughs> luckily were, for you you know luckily for me yeah <laughs> so how long did you do the teaching for that for about two years two two years full-time and um it was great so what, what was the next step I went to Washington, D.C., because, again, I'm still into the whole I want to save the world uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. I went to Washington, D.C., and I worked for the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and that was located in the middle of New York, uh, of D.C., and we were doing solar greenhouses. I was in charge of their rooftop solar greenhouse, and we, and we had worm composting in the basement, which, again, all of this is very popular now, but this yeah. was back in the, very, the late 70s. And, uh, and we were using it as a demonstration uh, to show people, especially people in government, what is possible, you know, how you could uh, do that. And we did legislation for, to, to pass to the Congress and, and I did that. And then I also uh, ended up, but I didn't like uh, Washington DC. Washington DC is, uh, is a, Company it's town. kind of sterile kind of uh, place. Yeah, it? it's a company town. If you're not heavy into the government world, that's not your place. And I, I mm. wasn't. It's beautiful. I yeah, just wasn't. <laughs> it's one. Of, it's one of the things that uh, Jane and I constantly fall out about every time Washington comes up on the TV, because we flew out of Washington. At, oh, you at, did. At, yes, at one. I can't remember which part of our journey, but uh, it was just as sort of the dusk was falling and. The, the the sight of Washington DC with the White House and Washington morning it was just beautiful, but Jane had fallen asleep. So oh. I didn't wake her up because she was tired. Oh. <laughs> She's constantly, because I'll go, it looks beautiful. And she's well, I don't know about this year. So <laughs> it's a, she'll always hold that against me. Hold you, yeah. I, when we, when my husband and I went to uh, Paris and we're in this little uh, boat going down the Seine and we're passing the uh, Eiffel Tower. And my husband was fast asleep and I was like trying to wake him and saying, the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> well, so you'll, you'll, you'll slept right through the pipe, yeah. Eiffel Tower, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're right, sterile. It's, uh, it, it's, it's beautiful to visit. But anyway, um, I ended up moving up to uh, Vermont and working at landscape design. And you say, why Vermont? Well, at that point, I had kind of decided that moving to the country was the answer, you know, back Institute for local self-reliance instilled that in me, self-reliant living, Vermont, you know, and, um, and it was in terms of uh, association with stone and all, I lived in Northern Vermont, which is 
right near Barry, Vermont. Do you know Barry, mm -hmm. Vermont? Yes, yes, yes. There's the Stone Foundation. I've had a couple of uh, their uh, symposiums there. Yeah, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And and I used to go and watch them just uh, uh, quarry that granite out of the ground in those giant, giant, giant quarries, Rock of Ages and all those places. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, stone. And um, I was a landscape designer there, and which was quite great. In a small stone. practice? Very small practice, and, and then ended up working in a company uh, based in Burlington, Vermont, which is on the Lake Champlain. It's the most beautiful place, so beautiful, um, called Garden Way. And Garden Way made Garden Way carts. They made Troy-built rototillers. They were all about gardens. They had a garden publishing company. And I worked for them because they were making solar greenhouses and I had a lot of experience and I wrote the manuals for their solar new solar greenhouse. Um, and I chose all them all the items to sell as accessories to the greenhouse. And that was in the early 80s. Yeah, I mean, that would be very kind of uh, far in advance than solar panels then. Oh, it was great. It was great. It was, you know, and, and the response was wonderful in Gardway. Um, they uh, they were a wonderful company to work with. Um, but then they, a uh, recession hit in the United States in the early 80s. And things kind of, think they were letting go of a lot of people. They didn't let go of me, but I decided to leave because it was just, it was a very tough time back in the early 80s in the States. And um, I married my husband um, and we proceeded to... Uh, uh go to warmer climate because vermont is so cold northern <laughs> vermont is cold minus 30 in the winter and we went to uh new orleans as a young married couple and i went for my master's degree and he worked down there we bought a house and uh we let the good times roll Laissez les bon temps rouler. Uh, did you go to New Orleans? And no, no, we didn't make it to New Orleans. I guess there's no rock there. It's, <laughs> it's all, you know, they call that soil there gumbo. You know, it's all uh, very swampy. Okay. So yeah, you missed that. That's on your next trip. <laughs> and so, were you were you uh, sort of practicing your landscape design down there? I went. I went to. I went for my master's degree again, full scholarship, and I studied. Uh, city planning, urban regional planning, because, you know, now I was going beyond the garden into, uh, into big projects, you know, using my, my landscape architecture background and uh, did very big projects, 84 acres. And, um, but it, it, and, and so you say, well, how do you, how do I square that off with you know like organic gardening and flower planting and everything but you know it's all earth-based everything i've ever done has been based on the earth was that public or private uh, clients uh, uh, i worked for a landscape architecture office and our clients were, were corporations basically okay. or land development and we would do uh do layouts and schemes for uh i did one for the center of uh, i did one for the uh, railroad, Missouri Pacific Railroad owned 84 acres in the middle of New Orleans, right in the middle next to the uh, con convention center. And they wanted to know what to do with it, the highest and best use of what to do with this land. Well, of course, we figured out, we, we worked with a very big real estate research corporation to figure out the highest and best use. And uh, and it was a, a wonderful uh, presentation of retail, multifamily housing, et cetera, et cetera. And, but the con convention center needed a parking lot. So mm. guess what happened? <laughs> mm. and so, so, you know, at that point it's like, okay, here we go. Yeah. Great parking lot, charge the cars, $10 a day. You make lots of money. Great. So that's what ended up happening, unfortunately. But um, um, from there again, family called and came back to New York after about four or five years in, in uh, Louisiana. And that is when my husband and I started our landscape design build company in here in the Hudson Valley in Westchester County, New York. And that was about 35 years ago. And uh, we've been doing it ever since. We've been doing a high end residential uh, landscapes, pools, entryways, 
backyards, gardens for for people here. And that's really what I've been doing for 35 years. And as you know, the, the podcast is all about stone. So where did where did your affinity with stone kind of, um, how did that kind of enter into your your being, shall, shall we say? So you can imagine after bopping around the world the way I did and being in Japan and in Vermont and all these places, Hudson, working with stone was almost just a natural. In fact, I never really thought of it as a, as a specialty or I just did it. It wasn't thought about. And I guess it, because I had, I had absorbed it all so much being doing all the things that I had done. And it, I, I use natural stone in almost every pro, in every landscape project, stone walls, stone walks, stone features, uh, stone uh, gravel driveways, that stone, uh, stone edgings, channel drains, dry streams. It's all various forms of stone in, in the landscape. Do you have an affinity with the natural material or do you well, sometimes use manufactured materials? Never. Never. It's always natural. You know, so uh, what ended up happening, and this is how I... Uh, after all these many decades working, I decided at one point about 10 years ago that I had to share what I had learned as a, as a garden designer, landscape designer. And so I wrote a book called Heaven is a Garden. And one of the chapters was called A Rock's Resonance. And in that chapter, I, I spoke about working with natural stone in the landscape. And I talked about its enduring qualities and its 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 asset as a grounding element in our lives. And I kind of waxed a little poetic about the resonance of rocks and how, if you can, if it's possible to use rocks from the site, if you're so lucky to have them. Now, what's interesting about that is people around here where I live, where we have a lot of rock, view rock as a liability, like it's a problem. And I'm saying, no, it's, it, make it your greatest asset. This is something very special and wonderful. And I say, you know, rock has been here way before we ever showed up. And it's going to be here way after we mm-hmm. leave this mortal coil. And I said, use it, embrace it, enjoy it. Um, and the publisher of the book, Heaven is a Garden, said to me, you like rock, don't you? And I never had thought about it. I really, had said, and I said, yeah, I guess I do. Yeah, I guess I really do. <laughs> and he said, uh, why don't you write a book about stone, natural stone in the landscape? And I said, you want me to write a whole book about stone in the landscape? And he said, yeah. And I thought, well, how am I going to fill a whole book? Well, <laughs> as you well know, <laughs> David, I mean, it, I wrote 40 pages too much, <laughs> as you well know, once you get into it. And, and, uh, and that's how my book, The Spirit of Stone, came about. And that's how I started to think all about stone. So it was just a kind of developing philosophy then. It wasn't something that you had kind of been uh, thinking about very kind of, you know, for furthermost in your mind, it was just no. or or through speaking to other landscape designers, it's just something that kind of emerged from within yourself. Exactly, which you know, and it, it takes somebody like the, that publisher, Paul Kelly, to point it out to me, and I went, "Oh, what do you know? I guess you're right. I do like stone." And then I, and then once I got into it, I realized how how much I really appreciated it. And you know, it's interesting because when you know stone so deeply in your soul you work with it and all the your friends and all the people you have on your podcast you know talk about working with stone but so when you come so when somebody who's not a stone artist who's not a stone mason comes to it it's it's a whole different understanding and i had i came to the same understanding that you have of it from the back door you know from the Mm -hmm. garden from the garden side and um, I just felt that uh, I am now such an advocate for incorporating native rock in, in outdoor settings. 
I, I think one of the things you do really well within the Spirit of the Stone is you, you kind of outline that um, as humans, we, we, we have a long, long association with, with the material. It's something deep within us. It's something that's really difficult to actually articulate. Um, and so many people just take it for granted. It used to be a major part of, of everybody's lives. Um, you, you know, right back to whenever, whenever we emerged out of the cave. But now we're kind of losing that connection. And I think what's part of the podcast is, is kind of trying to put, put, put the idea that it is more than just, you know, rocks to, that's a problem to get rid of, or, you know, it's something to consider in the, in the kind of, in a wider kind of sense. And, and what I, when I give my, my talks, cause I give talks to go along with the, the spirit of stone, the book, I say to people, I say, uh, don't, don't place a wooden bench in your, in your garden or in your landscape, I said, make a stone bench. And they say, well, why? Why stone benches? I said, you, we need to be grounded. We are, all of us, children, and grownups, old people, we're all now just staring at screens. Yes. I mean, look at us. We're all staring at screens. And especially the young people, they're not grounded to the earth. They're kind of up there in the ether at this point. And um, especially the ones who play all the games and everything. And I said, just the just by sitting on a stone bench, you're getting grounded. It's, it, it offers so much. And if we if we if we allow ourselves to break away from that and not to have it within our lives, I think that'll be to the great detriment of ourselves. Oh, absolutely. And and you see how people respond. Like even the thing that you did for uh, the Chelsea Garden Show. Um, yeah. Uh, everybody just i'm sure they all just totally responded to that am i right i'd like to know frank yeah 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 a any of the kind of projects that you get involved in it's amazing how many people will come up and go oh, i just love stone. i love i love natural stone it's it, it does something so it's definitely something that i think people respond to though they it's difficult to explain why well that's interesting because i have a facebook page called the spirit of stone when i post i try to post every single day something to do with natural stone on have you ever seen that page oh yes yes i mean that's how i became aware of yourself oh oh great okay so i just recently posted a uh, a photo of stones in a jar and i said to everybody i said do you collect stones and do you put them in jars and i thought maybe i get 10 responses Oh my goodness, David, I got so many responses from people who say, I've got stones and bowls. I've got stones and jars. My wife won't let me in the house with any more rocks. You know, it was, and it was like, it was, it's this visceral uh, connection that we have with rocks. And, and, and at this point we're relegated to collecting little beautiful uh, pebbles or whatever and putting them in jars. When, when we moved into this house, it's 25 years ago, uh, we had the, the removal men come in and, uh, took a few hours to get all our belongings, but an hour or so just carrying my stones. <laughs> and they were going, what are we doing? Are we doing? <laughs> but so I, I'm sure I, they can relate to that. I, I, I've had people that tell me that they literally had a stone that their grandfather placed in the front yard. And when they moved, they made sure to carry that rock to the, to the next place. It carries a message through time. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. It, it is. And then and then and also in my talk, I always talk about the fact that it's recyclable. You know, you can wash it off with water. It's weather resistant. I mean, I try to give all these reasons of why you should consider it. I mean, think about it. They, they keep pushing these concrete uh, uh, ersatz stone products. Mm -hmm. You know, concrete eventually will wear away. It will crack. It will do whatever. Stone doesn't do that. No, with climate change and everything, the carbon footprint of these kind of concrete products is just massive. Where, you know, right, right, you know, stone is local. Exactly. That was one of the things I was going to ask for. So, within your own practice, it's obviously kind of a major part of uh, your kind of de design process. How easy do you find working with the trade uh, within your, you know, the landscaping sort of oh, designs well, that you, okay. you that, yeah, that so you come up and imagine. I'm not you, right? So I have to find someone to do that magic with stone that you do. And of course, just like so many other skill sets, 
we are losing that whole artisanship in this country. I mean, the ability to to just build a dry laid stone wall is is being lost. Do people say, oh, yeah, I know how to build a stone wall, but they don't. No, they really no. don't. And, and there's a whole, as you know, there's there, there's a whole way to build a, a stone wall that won't fall apart in, in five years. And did and you then, find that easier when you first set out on? Oh, yeah. Of your practice, yeah. Oh, yes. there was, there'd still be the kind of old timers out there that could do it in yes. the correct way. The Italians, because the, where I live in Hudson Valley was a lot of Italians. In fact, they had come here to build the great stone structures that we have. As you know, where I live in Croton on Hudson, New York, we have one of the most amazing um, hand-hewn stone structures in the world. In the yeah, world. It's, an, it's an impressive uh, site. It's called the, the New Croton Dam. And and it was all built before machines. It was built with uh, horses and 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 hand hewing every block of stone. I I hope you incorporate a photo of that. I will into do. This. I will do. And and the, so in order to build this magnificent uh, stone structure, the they had a lot of Italians come to right here to this little town from Italy, and over the course of generations, they were the ones who built the stone churches around here, the stone buildings. We have all these stone buildings in Croton and Hudson. Croton and Hudson's amazing for stone people. And uh, and then trickle down to what I do, you know, stone walls, stone patios. But as as time goes on now, those generations are of stone masons are gradually disappearing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's do, a shame. So you, you, do you find that kind of loss of skill has a knock-on effect for your your practice? Yes, yes, yeah. and and, uh, and, uh, and it's hard to find somebody who's truly and and most homeowners don't know what a good stone wall is, you know. Mm. But I do. I do you do. find do you find that frustrating? Oh, very, very mm. frustrating. And I'm urging young people. I mean, there are schools that right that teach dry laid stone walls and stone masonry, but they're few and far between. But I say there, it's a great profession, right? Mm. I mean, you, you well know. I, I, I'm not quite sure what it's, what the situation is like in the U S but I think there is a, a beginnings of a move away from just the academic to recognizing that we do have these skill gaps and there is um a sort of drive towards reintroducing the kind of hand skills. And I, I'm kind of slightly hopeful that uh, as things move, progress forward from here, that there are more opportunities to, to learn the craft. Oh, I totally agree with you. Hands-on, I mean, hands-on learning, that, that's the way to go. Um, mm. And here I am, I, I, I taught at, um, I taught at night at uh, Columbia University at, for seven years I taught there and um, I all our projects I would try to make them hands-on learning we would go out there in the dark measuring and things because it was nighttime classes just so that people you know it's not just sitting there taking notes you got to learn how to do it have you always written then okay yes I've always written I've always <laughs> I've always written I wrote my first book when I was Eight. It didn't get published, but it was a book. <laughs> I, yet. It hasn't been yeah, published yet. It hasn't been published yet. And uh, when I was uh, at the University of Hawaii and I was living on that organic farm, um, a company came and put up uh, greenhouses on the farm that I lived on and they were growing tomatoes hydroponically. I was so impressed with what they were doing. I ended up writing. Um, a book on gardening without soil when I was in my early 20s that was published and uh and that was my first book and then um I wrote a book on trees called ortho's all about trees it's for the it's an ortho book series and then um in the last 10 years I've literally written four books I think I'm done now for a while <laughs> you impressed me with your your writing regime go and explain a little bit about that <laughs> so my my book heaven is a garden which i just was one of those I, I call that my passion project because i said i have to share what i've learned i just have to um and i have these photos that i can show people so i would get up at five o'clock every morning and would write for two hours before work 
And my husband, Raphael, would say to me, what are you doing in front of the computer? And I tell him, I'm writing a book. And he'd be like, roll his eyes, like, oh, God, here we go. But um, did you have a publisher at that point? No, no. I wrote the entire book. I, I put together all the photos. I figured it all out. And then I thought, oh, this would be this would be a cinch. I'll just uh, get it published. Ha ha ha. <laughs> well, um, it, it, I think it took longer to find a publisher than it did to write the whole book. But um, I found a wonderful publisher named St. Lynn's Press out of Pittsburgh, and they published Heaven is a Garden and then the subsequent Spirit of Stone, Spirit of Stone right there. And, um, and then from there, um, several years went by and I wrote Garden Topia. Mm -hmm. That's with uh, Countryman Press, which is an uh, imprint of W.W. W. Norton. And just a month ago, this yeah. came out. Yay. <laughs> and how is that? So I think going? I think I'm finished now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's good, you know, it's it, it's gaining traction and it, it's, it's 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 all good. Yeah, I, I, funnily enough, I just checked on Amazon. I didn't think it would be available in the UK, but I can see you could I can actually order oh, it on good. Amazon. Yeah, so oh, good. Oh, I will, I'm happy. I will order up a coffee. Well, thank you. Thank you. You probably see some familiar sights in here, frankly. And of course, you know, there's is stone in every single one. I would love to come back and have another podcast with you so we could talk about some some stone ideas for the landscape, if that's okay with I you. Would, I would love that. We'll, we'll do that in, in the future. With your writing, got lots of speaking engagements. Yes, it, Keeping I you do. very busy. Yes, I do. You know, it, it, it's a passion of mine is to, is to share share the love and share the knowledge. And, uh, and you know, this whole COVID incident, people one good thing from it is that people have become much more attuned to their surroundings because they have to be, you know, they've yes. been in house arrest almost. And um, so people are, 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 it looks like it's been, if, if, if our neighborhood is anything to go by, it looks like it's been a boom time for garden designers. Oh, wow. I'm so busy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Which is That's great. I mean, yeah, it means that people are really, really starting to relate to the, to their little piece of earth. So I hope you've enjoyed that today. I know you're busy and got things oh, to it. do today. Um, so we will we'll just kind of say a kind of formal goodbye. Great. And I hope to come back and, and, and keep our conversation going about yeah, many uses of stone. Too. So we'll just wave bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.